So one of the things that new engineers to Golang struggle the most is grasping goroutines, channels, and sometimes weight groups. And I think by showing you guys a real world example and then fixing it with these concepts, I think it will help you better understand them. So here I have a simple service that is part of, let's say, a shot server. And this code is responsible to fetch a user's active shots and, for example, his friends that he can speak with, right? But first we need to get his uh, username from his ID. And at the end of the function, what we want to do is return all of this data together. And how can we implement this without some sort of concurrency, right? So what we need to do is to create, for example, a function that is going to simulate getting data, for example, get user shots, shots, and it's going to, to receive the user ID. And it's going to return a slice of strings, for example. These are going to be the messages, the, the shots. And let's just return some mock data. Uh, so we can chat with John, with Jane, and with Joe, for example, right? Now let's add some time here. So this request is going to take, for example, two seconds. This is a very expensive operation, for example. And now we go here and we call get user shots and we pass in the user ID that we first fetched, right? So this operation here is going to take one second. And then this one up here is going to take two seconds. So at least we're going to be waiting three seconds for this operation to complete. Now let's add some more data. Uh, more more calls get user um, friends for example so we can return this to the front end and they can show all of this UI so very similar it's going to receive the ID and it's going to return a slice of string let's wait here for some seconds for example just a second and then here we can say that he um, for, we can just copy these friends, these active conversations, and then there is more, for example, um, James, um, Tiago, I don't know, you name it. So this is it. Now at the end, we can, for example, just log this. So I'm going to get the, the shots and the friends as well. Let me just print the shots and the friends. So we could either return these to our front end, but since this is just an example, I'm just going to log this and let's run this program. So you could see that first we got the username and then after some seconds we got these two entries all together because the logs are after the blocking so this is blocking and then we wait for this three, uh, two, um, two seconds and then we wait again for one second then we can get the logs if i do this we can see they are coming um one after the other, so we wait two seconds and then we get this one. So you can see the problem. So let's add some benchmarking and I'm going to calculate the time that the program took so we can actually see the results instead of just guessing by visually, right? So I'm going to do a time dots now and at the end I'm going to log the time since the, the program started, so time dot since now and if we run again the program, we should have at least four seconds, um, which is the combination of all of those calls. So we got four seconds exactly. And yeah, this is the problem. This is what would happen if we didn't do concurrently. Now, we can start thinking, how can we actually do this? And the first thing that might come to mind is, can we do these things together? Or at least at the same time, we can start dispatching them into different processes. And then uh, we get the results whenever they do we get them. With this approach, what happens is that we have to at least wait for two seconds because this is the, 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 most, the most expensive call of this tree. And this is really the point of failure. The longer this takes, 
the longer it's going to um, take the program to run. And then there is another thing, which is we need the ID for both of these calls. So this needs to be called first either way, right? So let's introduce go routines, right? So let me delete this output from here and this output from here. And let's just add the go keywords behind this. So what's going to happen is that we are dispatching these two go routines and it's creating behind the scenes go, it's creating a lightweight thread for these two processes. So they are both starting at the same time whenever they finish. Now that is the problem that we need to fix. So let's actually execute this and see what happens. So it took one second, the program, right? And that second was because of this call that takes one second, right? Let's run it again. One second. So we are not waiting for these calls, but we are not getting anything from these guys as well, right? And that is the next thing that we need to do. So introducing channels. So let's create a channel here. And this is the syntax for it. So channel of, and this, in this case, we can create a channel of a type. And we need a unified type for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this message. You can do this with an any interface um, like this. Or if it's an integer, you can do this. But I'm going to create a unified message. And I'm going to show you um, later in the video. Yeah, this is going to make sense. But I leave this to your imagination, how you can um, communicate between these two functions. So let me just create this type here. And it's going to have the chats, which is going to be a slice of strings, and then a friends, which is going to be a slice of string as well. Okay. So we have now a unified message type. And let's pass this channel to these functions. And add has a parameter as well, which is going to be a channel of message. Okay. Right, so they are, they are receiving the channel, and this is how you're going to communicate within uh, this flow, right? Instead of returning, we are not returning anything. You cannot accept return from a goroutine. Close that. And instead, let me put this inside the channel. So this is what we're going to do. We are sending a message to the channel. Now we need to adjust this to be of type message. And this is the shots, so we're going to be filling in the shots with that slice. So you can see how different it is. So instead of returning, we are sending a message to this channel here. Let's do the same for the friends. So that is done. So let's run. Nothing special is going to happen. Okay, so it took the same time. We didn't get any results. We're not printing anything. So how it happened is that this channel is receiving uh, data. But there is a big problem here, which is this channel, when it receives a message, it's not being handled, right? So this channel is never first, it's not being closed. So we need to close this resource and then we need to consume this message. Okay. Now to consume this channel, what we can do is there is multiple ways to consume it, but we are going to loop over the channel. So let's do a message range of channel. We can do this in channels. And here we can see that this is the off type message. And let's just uh, print this so we can see what it gets. Okay. Let's see what happens now. We got a message and then we got an error. This is the deadlock that I was waiting to get. So we got both messages from the channel. So that is nice. But then we got another problem, which is that a deadlock occurs. And why is this deadlock occurring? And this is very crucial to learn um, because it, it can catch you by surprise. So really the problem can be seen if you go back to the logs and you take a look. We got this log, but we never have reached this part of the code. And really the problem is here. So this is waiting for the channel message to come, but it never comes. So we get those two, but there is, it keeps waiting for the next message that is never coming. So what we need to do is close the channel. And uh, there is a very good quote that I'm going to show you guys. And if you are interested, go and take a look at this article that I'm leaving in the description. But really idea is that 
every time you use the go keywords in your program, you must know how and when that go routine will exit. If you don't know that answer, there's a potential memory leak. And that is really what is happening here. So whenever you create this channel, we need to know a way to close it right away. So in this case, if we did um, this flow, there is no way that we can programmatically close it because, I mean, we can come here and close it after this call, but let's try this actually. Let's see if this works. It works, but the problem is that if you wanted to add another function call here below, you'd have to close it there. You can see the problem that it might arise for code readability. How can we better do this? And here it is where it comes, the weight groups. Now let's go ahead and create a weight group from the sync package. So sync.weight group. Let's make this a pointer. And if you want to learn more about weight groups, really just go over to the definition or hover over the uh, the weight group. And here we have a really good explanation from the developers. So weight group waits for a collection of go routines to finish. This is really what we need because after the routines have finished, there is the, the quo for us to close the channel. So how do we do this? There is three pieces. So the first one is that we need to say weight group dot add. And what this does is that's okay. How many go routines do we need to wait for? And in this case, it's two. So there is multiple ways to do this more efficient. And so we don't have to hard code this, but I'm going to be simple and just do this like this. Okay. Then the next thing we need to do is after these go routines, we need to wait. So let's wait before the wait group is finished. And then the last piece is inside of the, of the functions, we just say wait group dot done. So we also need to pass in the wait group. And we just call done on one and then on the other one as well, we just synchronize as well and just say done. So now at this point, we can safely close the channel right here, right? At this point, we know that the message have been sent, we can close it. And there is still a missing piece that I have not introduced, but I want to run this program and show you guys what's going to happen. So it's taking quite a lot and you can see that we got this bigger message and again, we got the deadlock. So the problem here is a bit more tricky and it's because we have this channel that does not have a buffer and this wait group. So we are waiting for a message to come, but the channel can only hold one message. And there is a thing on channels that there is a second parameter, which is the size of the buffer. We can pass in the size, for example, let's pass in two. And why this is, is because after all, when we send an operation to a channel, it blocks until there is a response coming. So until there is someone handling it, it's going to block the channel, right? So it is possible to create channels that have an internal message buffer and sending operations on such, such a buffer channel only blocks whenever the buffer is full. So let's go ahead and add a buffer size, for example, we can add 20, 200, but here it makes sense to add the buffer of two so we can just see the limits why we need two. And it is because we have two messages, then we can go ahead and handle them with the buffer. So whenever this is done, we have to message inside the buffer to read and handle. And that is what, what's going to happen, right? So when uh, we run this code here, we can see that it's going to work perfectly. So we got the first one and then we got the, the messages handled. And here we got three seconds, right? So this is three seconds because it was one second from this call and then two seconds from the, the the one that takes the most. If this would take one second, this operation would take two seconds. That's if this would take four seconds, everything would take four seconds because that was the most expensive operation and they were being processed um, parallel, right? So it is also important to consider that when using buffered channels like this, 
there is the risk of losing data in case of the service which dies. So the messages inside the buffer would not be handled. Uh, then we would just lose this data, right? But then again, uh, there is solutions to circumvent that problem, but we are not going into them in this video. And there is another thing that I want to show you guys when working with GoRoutines, which is, which is this example here. So consider this function that we have. It's a wiki. It creates a channel of integers and it spawns an anonymous GoRoutine, which basically just listens for a message and means prints after. So the problem, the, the program will not be blocking because it is running on the GoRoutine. So a different um, thread would be running these codes and listening for the channel. Or a message on the channel but this is not going to throw an error when you whenever you run this and call wiki it's not going to throw an error on the console but if you look closely we will see that values are never sent to the channel so no one is writing to the channel and the go routine will never return because of that it's stack will never be deallocated in the garbage collector so this is going to cause a memory leak and if in your program you call this multiple times and resources starts um, stacking together. This is going to be a problem and it's going to be one of the silent problems that you're going to have. So there are two things that I usually recommend doing when working with GoRoutines. The first is know when to close a GoRoutine whenever you create one. So always know when you should close this. An example would be to defer close um, when the function returns, for example. And the other thing is make sure that messages are always being sent and you are not just listening for for it because this can happen right so after this if you still have uh, doubts about how to use guillotines what i really recommend you is to play around with this example or any other example that you might come to your minds and further resources that i would also suggest would be this article a tour of go especially on the guillotines section and then this book about the Go programming language, I think these are our must reads if you want to get deeper into Go, uh, especially Go routines as well. So if you like this video, let me know and consider leaving a thumbs up, maybe subscribe and I see you on the next one.